Hello audience. In this video we're going to throw this thing together and see if it runs. Now the head gasket is not marked top or front, however there is a right and wrong way to install it. So you can see the front and back have these kidney shaped coolant passages. The rear one is bigger than the front. As you can see, they line up with the block now. But like this, not so much. Although it would probably still work that way, the correct way is like this. And I clear coated the engine using this stuff because it was the only thing I could find at AutoZone that had a satin finish as opposed to gloss. Which is one thing I don't like about using clear coats on stuff is it looks like it has a clear coat on it, which I didn't want on this. It did have kind of a gloss finish to it when I was done, but this is a few days later and it's kind of dulled out. It's not completely flat, but it kind of looks like a film of oil over the engine which I'll settle for that. It still looks good. It still works with the general theme I was going for of it being clean but not too clean. As you probably already noticed, the way I'm assembling the engine now, I'm putting it together so it looks pretty much like a 1913 engine, like what should be in this car, hence the oil pan and the transmission housing. Now there's a few small parts I still don't have for it. I don't have the right crank handle, I don't have the right intake manifold, I do have the right carburetor though, although it needs some work. But I don't really care about any of that. That's all just small parts that can be added on at any time. Right now I just want to get it running. Last time I put this engine together, it had a Z head on it, which it's an aftermarket aluminum head with 6 to 1 compression. And it's a really easy, cheap way to just bolt on more power with no modifications. And it worked pretty well, but I decided to go for an original head with this for a few reasons. First of all, with the added compression, it does take more muscle to spin the engine over, so if you don't have an electric starter, that can be an issue. It's not impossible to spin them over, but it is a little more annoying. Another thing is, since they're putting out more power, they don't quite idle down or accelerate as smooth as like a stock engine does. Another thing is, if the engine has any knocking or rattling to it, it generally gets louder. The head that's on here now is what's commonly referred to as a low head. This is a stock original that was used from 1913 through 1917-ish, so it's correct for the car. It's called the low head because the head that replaced it was higher, and that's referred to as a high head. In spite of the name, these actually have a slightly higher compression than the high head, which was used later on. These have about a 4.1 to 1 compression, whereas the high head has about 3.9 to 1. Is that a noticeable difference? I don't know, and at this point I don't really care. Now, since the head is lower, it does use a different set of bolts. However, the mounting locations for the water outlet and the number of studs is all the same as the later engines, so these do directly interchange. Now this is what's known as a brass radiator or brass era radiator, and is what this car should have on it. Now the general rule on this is they were used from 1909 through 1916. Now there's a number of people that have cars from the 20s, they're converting to brass era cars, or they're putting later engines in brass era cars, or they're just building them up from parts like what I'm doing. But these will work on later cars, in fact they'll work on most Model T's, but there's a few interchangeability problems to look out for. 
The first thing is the water outlet that goes on the cylinder head. The brassier radiator uses all its own. It's really stubby and it just points slightly up as opposed to the 1917 and newer ones which point almost straight up. You don't see good originals around very often but it doesn't really matter because you can buy them new fairly easily. The other thing is the cooling fan. Now this is the series of fan that was used pretty much from 1909 through 1919. The only real big difference they had was around 1917 the hub went from being made of brass to being made of steel and the bracket was changed. This is the longer bracket used for a 17 or newer radiator. This is the one used for a brassier radiator. As you can tell it's a little bit shorter and it's got that slight angle to it. Around 1920 this was replaced with an aluminum hub fan that was designed completely different and I don't know if they work with the brass here or radiators or not. And then in 2627 the fan was redesigned so it attached to the water outlet which obviously you can't use that with these. I bought this one off eBay and replaced the bushings because I was going to use this on the truck and I probably will eventually because that one's shot but I don't have a fan for this car so I'm just going to swap out the bracket and use it. And eventually I'll either find an original brass fan or just buy a new one. But the point of the whole story is if you're using a brass radiator you need these two parts. Another little thing to watch out for is the fan is a lot closer to the crank, so you want to make sure there's plenty of room between them. New problem, I don't have radiator hoses for this. Now the old ones, I probably threw them away because they were trashed and I didn't order a set of new ones and I don't want to order a set now and wait a couple of days for them. So I went to AutoZone, found a couple of random hoses. This one's a one and three quarter inch and this one's a two inch. And I can make one, possibly even two sets out of this. now it's time for another update about this car because a few things have happened. Now you may notice as I've said before it's on the wrong frame and I plan to replace it so you might have wondered why am I reassembling it on the old frame. Well there's the frame I plan on using. I got it sandblasted and my original plan was I was going to 
repair that while I was putting the engine together, and then bolt everything on that permanently. But I ran out of time, and there's a few events I plan to drive this car on, so if the engine doesn't need to be taken apart again, I need to get this thing ready to drive. So I decided to put that on hold for now. Now I'm currently making a video on that, so when I get the frame done, you'll see that. I've also been putting everything else on it. It has the fenders and some of the lights. I got new running boards for it because everything else is new. And the body man is currently working on fitting the rear fenders. This one is just about ready to go. The back of the body has kind of been on hold until we get this done, so I'll probably get back to work on this sometime and you'll see that in a future video. Another big step forward is I found a top frame for it, or at least a set of top sockets which I was kind of worrying about, because pretty soon we're going to have to start working on the top, and I just haven't been able to find anything for it. Well, this is a complete set, and it's in pretty good shape. The bows are not in the greatest condition, but that doesn't matter, because I already bought a set of new ones right there. Now, you may remember last time I drove this, I made a big deal about how, even though I have an original tail light, I couldn't use it, because I didn't have any way of attaching it. Well, I since got the mounting bracket for it, and there it is. It still needs to be rebuilt, but it's on there now. I also made a temporary set of floorboards, and I'm working on some semi-permanent temporary seat upholstery. I was also able to put together a horn for it. I had bits and pieces of about three different ones, and I was able to put together one good one and then ordered the conduit kit for it. So if we can't stop, we can at least warn the pedestrians. <laughs> now to start this, I am borrowing a few parts off of the truck. I'm going to use the carburetor off of it. Reason being, I've road tested it, obviously. It runs really good, it's really reliable, and I know exactly how to set it for cold starting an engine. Also going to use the coils out of it because, again, I've road tested them. They work perfectly. And also, I don't entirely trust the Magneto right now. Because theoretically, it should work perfectly, but these cars laugh in the face of theory. So I'm going to start it on battery. And I borrowed the battery out of the truck. So once we get the engine running properly, then we'll worry about whether or not the Magneto works. Normally, if I'm starting a Model T engine that's just been assembled, I usually pour at least a quart of oil directly in the transmission. This will help to pre-lubricate everything. I mean, if you don't do this, it'll probably work anyway, but this helps. Now we're ready to start it. Obviously, because of the new bearings and the new rings, it does turn, but it's still really stiff. Now, it doesn't have an electric starter, so traditionally, we either tow it with another car or take it to the top of a hill and roll it down. I'm going to take it to the top of a hill and roll it down.
for sure. Uh, I think we'll make it. And the first try, it didn't start. It fired a couple of times with the choke all the way closed, and now it's not doing anything. So we took it apart, and it looks like there's no fuel going to the cylinders. Now what's strange is, open the float, open the float bowl, and there's fuel coming out of the carburetor. Correction, it stopped draining. So that answers that. So we established there was no fuel getting to the carburetor. I tried taking the filter off and that helped but it still wasn't flowing properly. Well, later what I found out was the sediment bowl in the tank was just filled with rust or calcium or sand or all of the above and it was pretty much clogged up. And before anyone says it, I know this is the wrong tank for the car. It just happens to be the one that was on it when I got it, and up to now it's been working. So I cleaned it out good and thorough, and got a new fuel filter, and we're going to put it back together and see what happens. I also took the carburetor apart and cleaned it out just in case. Good news everyone, it runs. And better than that, it looks like I repaired everything I wanted to. Now first of all, that horrible clanking sound that it used to make, which I figured was the timing gear, that's gone now. It runs really quiet now. The magneto actually works. It's kind of surprising to me. But at a fast idle, it puts out around 12 volts, which is pretty much what it should do. It runs pretty good. It's not running the best right now. It's got some tuning issues that need to be sorted out, but that's not really a problem. The bands are working pretty good right now. The low and brake bands are engaging pretty smooth. Reverse, not so much. It's chattering a little bit, but that's kind of normal for new bands. It'll probably go away when it wears in. The one problem I did find is it looks like the crankshaft seal is leaking. It started to at first, and I was lying to myself saying it was just residual oil, but it got worse. So it is a problem, but it's not too much of a problem. There's ways to fix that. And that's about it. Everything else went according to plan. So the important thing is everything on the engine internally is done and doesn't need to be taken apart and redone anymore, which is what I wanted to accomplish. Since everything seems to be working out, I'm starting to get greedy a little. It runs on Magneto. Now I want to see if it'll start on Magneto. next thing I need to do is keep assembling this, because what I really want to do is start driving this everywhere, but I can't. Or at least I shouldn't. There's still a lot of stuff that needs to be done. Working on assembling the windshield, the rear wheel bearings are still loose, the tires are still about to explode. So I've ordered some parts and I'm currently working on all that, and 
when it gets back on the road, you'll see it in a future video. So anyway, that's it for now. So thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time. I'm sure the neighbors are starting to get sick of this by now, but once you install a bulb horn on a car, you can't just walk away from it. Ha, ha, ha.